Welcome to the Stories or Soul Food Podcast, presented by Canon Press and Great Homeschool Conventions. I'm going to open my Diet Coke. We're off to the races. What are we talking about today? Welcome to Stories or Soul Food. I'm Brian Cole. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm Andy Wilson. Faux Andy Wilson. <laughs> Faux Andy Wilson. Yeah. I'm Faux Cole. Yep. Okay. Well, today we really, we are diving into, when I first read it, I thought had to be the most unique story that you'd written. Okay. And then I realized that they're all pretty unique. But Outlaws of Time number one. They're all snowflakes. Each one unique and the same. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Outlaws number one, but I really kind of wanted to head into it as time travel. Why did you decide to write a time travel story? That feels like we've we've talked about sci-fi on this podcast before, and right. you tend to skew fantasy, but you think oh, yeah. sci-fi is fantasy. It is. It's just so can you kind of explain how, so how did you come up with this idea that feels just so strange, but <laughs> also seems to go together pretty well? Well, I had me a nightmare. Uh, have I talked about the fingers? Yeah, I talked with Remy. We talked about the finger lanes that came yeah. via a nightmare where I grabbed the convenience store worker's man bun and found a finger growing inside of it <laughs> oh, yeah. on the back of his skull. And that's how Corridan and the finger lanes that show up in the Coverage trilogy came to be. In this case, I had a dream. And it was not an optimistic <laughs> dream. It was not a dream of people being judged by the contents of their character. It that's, was That would be faux MLK if we went there <laughs> Yes, right it was a dream in which I was shot up both my arms repeatedly, shattering my bones from wrist to shoulder. You know, just up both sides, blam, 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 blam. This very evil arch villain did this to me. And my, my arms were going akimbo in every different direction. <laughs> and uh, I was dragged into a cave in this dream, and I skipping skipping woke up with this old man who had grafted live rattlesnakes into my arms oh to say very this is a very specific dream yeah. <laughs> it was a very very particular nightmare and so i had live rattlesnakes snacks live rattlesnakes rattlesnakes grafted into my arms and i had rattles on my shoulder plural a rattle on each and my arms were still going to Kimbo, slithering around. So my arms, I came to with my arms literally slithering across me and like twisting around behind me and moving <laughs> in very snaky ways. And then it kind of like skipped forward. It didn't really follow a story. It just jumped conceptually such that my hands could see in the dark. My left hand was nasty and mean. I had a horrible personality. My right hand was okay, you know, friendlier. Uh, my left hand wanted to kill me. Every time I was startled or surprised or threatened, I would start to rattle. The rattles would buzz on my <laughs> uh, on my shoulders, and my hands could see in the dark. So, and it just had separate consciousnesses. So, anyway, I came to, and I was a little disappointed. I should add, I had a fever. <laughs> was, nah. This was a fever nightmare. I woke up. I, the fever had broken, pouring sweat, and it was one of those dreams where. When I woke up, I did not realize that I was awake and it had been a dream. I fully expected my arms. I had fully adapted to this new reality. <laughs> and, <laughs> you, and, you had taken the next evolutionary step Yeah, forward. and I looked down at my hands and was like, what? Like, why are they not? Just skin. And I thought, that is an amazing character to try to write for multiple reasons. And then I thought, I wonder if this would work for young kids. And so I filled in some gaps in my nightmare and kind of kind of uh, enfleshed it a little bit, and I pitched it to my children that night. And a bunch of them spent the rest of the day drawing pictures of mm. this character, and I thought, okay, this, this, this works. This will preach. Yeah, this will work. And it was so sticky, and they could immediately, you know, as soon as I tell this to kids, as soon as I describe the situation to kids, but they always hold up their two hands they always kind of like look at the backs of their hands and they, you watch them kind of start moving their arms and feeling it. <laughs> and so I thought, okay, this is something really fun that I can work with. I'm going to build this, this character and take some other elements. 
However, I should also say that I had planned to do a fantasy Western. I had planned on doing a little time hopping always that had always been okay. part of the plan. So this just became the character. Uh, really, Sam Miracle was the, the birth of, you know, that, that nightmare gave birth to Sam Miracle who stepped into that spot, which was a piece of my canon that I had wanted to write always. And so I'd held kind of, it's one of those things that I'd actually marked with one of the 100 cupboards. There's a spot in there that you can, you can find in the list of cupboards. You can say like, oh, that's the one that takes you into the Outlaws of Time story. It's there. Yep. Yeah. And uh, a few listeners have mentioned that specifically. Yeah. And that's, so I was holding that spot. I wanted to do that. And the reason why is because the mythology down there is so different. And it's one of those things that where we do have, it's one of those places where we have ancient mythology, where we go way back. So yeah, is, hasn't the, my son was just walking through ruins from the, you know, the time of King Arthur and right. he's walking through ruins in New Mexico and Arizona. Cause that is the place that's been continuously inhabited for, for something a like long time millennia. Yeah. You for know? a very long time. And so the Southwest is one of those places where we actually have ancient history. Right. And, uh, ancient in scare quotes, we don't quite get like deep, deep BC, but we do have, yeah, we do have, uh, early, early history. We don't really know how far back it goes. Not a lot of oral tradition, right? But a, a lot of uh, human. A lot of clear human, like obvious architectural schools, petroglyphs, right. yeah. civilizations, Pictures, yeah. and and so on. Is that the Hopi Indians or is it a bunch of them? Uh, Chaka, Hopi. Yeah. And lot, then go a little lots. And then you go a little more south or later yeah. on. And, and the, it stretches into Central and then on down uh, into Central America. And there's then There's a lot Aztecs. there. There's also really interesting landscape that's unique to that region. So interesting, which gives it a mythos. So you, you have kind of the flat wheat fields rustling in the wind with big red barns and windmills is a very like, okay, that's one. Mm -hmm. The Southwest is a different. Yeah. And you're not the first person. Did you copy from the lost world with that, the, mm. the dinosaur story? Cause he's got the same plateau and the jungle where you kind of yeah. walk through the desert. No. No, I didn't do that. I didn't. I didn't steal from Crichton on that one. Yeah, I haven't even read that one. No, 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 no. Sorry, I, I'm talking. See? Uh, See, I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> no, the extra old one. I'm totally innocent. Not, not Kipling. The other oh, one. okay, I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, Conan Doyle. Mm. There we go. Let me, let's start that over. Were no, you copying? I'm not read. I'm not. Doyle? No, I was not copying Conan Doyle, and I think I just proved that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. But the Southwest is such a unique, a unique region, unique landscape, different creatures different civilizations, different mythology, and just a different texture to the whole thing. So also the visceral sensation, the heat down there is something I really, really love. I enjoy it a lot. You know, just yeah. there's, it's got an aggression to it that uh, is admirable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're going to spend some time talking about Riot in the future and snakes, but you, oh, have, yeah. you have much snake much crossover with snakes in all yeah. of your professional life, which I find, yeah. <laughs> does it extend I to do. your personal life as well? It, it does. Currently, we have Dave, the black-headed python, a rare Australian breed of python. Doesn't look, doesn't have the normal python looking head. It has a it more... jet black head. It okay. looks like it was made out of obsidian. I mean, it's just mm. jet black and kind of an autumnal body. You know, okay. it's really, really cool looking. Whereabouts um, are those guys? They're Australian. They eat lizards. They don't have the heat pits that pythons normally do because it does. It eats cold-blooded prey. It doesn't mm, doesn't need it. Doesn't That's need interesting. it. Okay. So the question is: This is kind of the funny part. Does it not have the heat pits because it was never going to need them, or did it start eating cold-blooded prey just because it didn't get them? <laughs> you yeah. Know, <laughs> um, you don't know how God yeah. does these things. But anyway, we have Dave. Before that, we had Jack. Jack was a, a little bull snake that my son caught right before kindergarten. And he lived for a long time through various trials and travails. Jack is the one that I learned how to force feed a snake. And he's probably one of the only bull snakes to ever eat cow. Because okay. I force fed him little balls of raw hamburger to nurse him back to health at one point. So Jack's like those terriers who attack animals that are way bigger than they are he's, <laughs> he's developed a taste jack was really little he was like a hatchling bull snake when my son caught him and and he he grew he never got to massive uh because he got lazy mm. and 
when you get lazy, you don't have to be a python eating an alligator in the Everglades to die from your prey. Uh, he he ate a mouse, a live mouse that he had not quite killed. He had just knocked it out, and he ate it, and the mouse uh, came to inside mm-hmm. him, and it was gruesome. <laughs> and they both died. That was the end of Jack the Bull Snake. And he wanted a hamburger. That's all. Yeah, the risk, the risks of constricting your prey are sometimes it it goes limp and unconscious, and it's not quite dead. <laughs> I'd never thought of that. And so that's you see that with uh, you know various pictures of pythons in in the glades that have tried to knock back an alligator that they thought was no moss, and, and that has yet, burst its way out. Yeah, yeah. And that alligator alligator comes to, and then you're dead mm-hmm. <laughs> at that at that point, right? So that's what happened to Jack, but just with a little rodent. But anyway, then then my son bought Dave, and he bought Dave in the in the full belief and the trust that we would eventually have a reptile zoo. He bought a snake that he thought would be interesting for a reptile zoo. Mm. So we have two giant African tortoises, and we've got Dave. The, they're the starter population of our reptile house. When eventually we have one at some point. That's great. No, well. My sons love catching garters, but we have trouble finding anything but garters. I think we're looking in the wrong spots. There's a lot of, a lot of garter snakes around here. That's kind of what we get. There are some interesting ones, and there are some really big ones that are unexpected when you get up on the mountain. But I'm kind of glad we don't have... I know. I don't have to worry about them catching snakes. I realize any other part of the country... Yeah, where we live, there just are not venomous snakes. Right. There's, uh, I think, a queen snake that's got a little bit of venom, but it's rear fanged and doesn't really do anything bad. You just tell your kids, like, if it rattles, you don't touch it, but we don't really have rattlesnakes. Yeah, you have to go looking for those. They can the show parts. up. Yeah. Uh, there's a gem shop in our town that has a, a live rattlesnake in one of the cases that they caught in the alley behind the building, downtown Moscow. Oh, I so, didn't know the, the, what's it? Or the sidewalk from. somewhere yeah. downtown. Yeah, so it's a rattlesnake they caught downtown here. It can happen. Okay. Um, Local provenance. <laughs> yeah, so, the, but the, that's because the farmers transferring the hay bales and that kind of stuff they can end up on farm rigs and moving around i don't know why we don't have them i'm just glad we don't have them right they absolutely can live here they live immediately south of here yep and they you know they can live higher altitudes and so on but we just don't have them so thank god for that kids can just catch snakes here anyway we got little rubber boas too right okay yeah rubber boas are fantastic those are great but they're more up on the mountain yeah Um, and we have bull snakes and other things but i guess we're cribbing on our riot conversation yeah we're moving into snake (laughs) conversation but anyway this it all ties into outlaws of time i was always going to write a southwestern time hopping story pulling from southwestern mythology and in that southwestern location and then my fever dream gave me the character with the snake arms and i was really drawn to that character especially because of how difficult it would be to write and i don't just want to write the same things over and over and over again I wanted to kind of like push the complexity. And so trying to write a character who has three different consciousnesses, a different personality in each hand Mm. and is relating to his own hands. Like he relates to acquaintances and they're behaving in different ways. And so (laughs) you cannot assume that his hands are just doing what he's doing and trying to write that, that trident character, that triple consciousness character was very attractive to me. Wait. Okay. Hold on. From the professional point of view accepting that pitch was it hard to get that pitch accepted you know time traveling kid with snakes in his arms no it was actually remarkably easy it was okay one of the easiest they were willing to go for it it. one of the easiest sales i ever made but then i did like i I told on on a previous podcast after i was things were coming to an end with ashtown and random house and they were not wanting to continue with ashtown they looked at the next series they'd already acquired for me which was you know outlaws of time and the new editor had a deep snake phobia. Mm. And, well, this would not be. Yeah, <laughs> and just did not want it at all. Like didn't want it. And so she very kindly gave it back to me. And I set it up at HarperCollins. And right when it was coming out, there was this explosion of um, whatever we want to call it, the, the Salem woke trials or mm. you know, <laughs> the, very, the very first, the tip of the spear <laughs> showed yeah. up. Uh, there were... A, a new game showed up in town, which is sensitivity readers, and you would pay people of particular ethnicities to read your middle grade or, or YA fiction and give it a thumbs up. 
Oh. And you, they would be like paid ambassadors that would sign off. And there was one librarian in particular whom I will not name. And so she was really going after anybody who used any kind of Indian mythology uh, at That was all. her specialization. Yes. And Southwestern specifically. And so that first book came out and HarperCollins was terrified. And I was honestly surprised they let me finish the trilogy because it became such a it became such a hot point. So that means they sent it out to a sample reader and she said it means they want me to. Okay. Gotcha. And they give me and they give me a name and they said, Hey, would you be willing to, you know, contract a sensitivity reader or this woman of this particular name is going to basically get a posse up and is going to destroy the release of this book. I think it's worth going into. This is not yeah, this because is the, basically it became so the the issues surrounding allies of time overwhelmingly became cultural appropriation. Yeah, and whether or not so, for example, I would no longer be allowed to write Ashtown. I would no longer be allowed to write Outlaws of Time in the New York marketplace because I am a cis white male, and being a cis white male in the past, when they were they were kind of getting the first the first movement of this was inclusion. We want more diversity of characters. Great. Um, I already was bored. You've already talked about you don't want the same Yeah, character. I was already bored with the idea of all fantasy being Northern European. Uh, but the thing is, all fantasy readers were Northern European. And so it, it kind of went that direction for a long time. Uh, you know, it's like it just was overwhelmingly Northern European. And then I find because of my own upbringing in the classical education and reading you know greek and persian and mediterranean mythology and then discovering that there's a lot of great stuff in the east uh mythologically speaking a lot of pretty fantastic persian stuff and then also southwestern central american stuff there's just really gnarly interesting stories that fit hand in glove with biblical history slash mythology it makes right. sense it all gels and it makes sense yeah uh, you know, these, these nations that were enslaved to other, you know, false deities, lesser gods, uh, that have been thrown down, fallen angels. So who are ruling the roost in different places all around the world. So anyway, it all, it all fits really, really well. So I was always really interested in venturing far yeah. afield and incorporating unexpected mythologies and unknown mythologies into my stuff. That's something I loved to do, and that made me a very hip kid in New York uh, for a minute. <laughs> yeah, well, that's- And then that minute passed, and it turns out, like, no, you can only do that if you are that, hmm. which is really problematic because yeah. it's, it's bizarre. It's just bizarre. You want readers to be able to see, I mean, this is the, the nature of healthy empathy. There's a lot of unhealthy empathy in the world, but, but healthy empathy is the ability to actually- relate to and connect with people who share a common humanity and have a completely different experience. They're coming, they're coming to their lives and their journeys from a completely different place than you are. And yet there are things you have in common. There's universalities that you have in common that you try to tap into with the story that enables little white kids in Seattle to connect with, you know, North African kids and enables North African kids to connect with you know, Mexican kids and Mexican kids right. to connect with some kid in New England. Yep. You know, it's like there's there's universal issues. There's u the universal situation for all mankind, right. regardless of context and setting. Yeah. When I was at, at grad school, that was one of the big things is yeah. they were, there were some Irish poets who had translated. He didn't fame. say grad school at Oxford, but he should have just said <laughs> When I was in my fancy school. <laughs> no, but this is, this is not going to reflect well on my fancy school. This, just the fact that someone could say, no, you should never translate poetry from another language because you are, you are appropriating. Right. Rather than sharing work that's valuable, you're appropriating right. work. And, and I'm thinking, but I'm never going to be able to read this this poetry if someone doesn't translate it for me. And uh, just yeah. the, the it's idea- It's funny that we were, we were gonna talk about time travel on this episode, but what we're actually talking about is cultural appropriation. <laughs> and it's important, this is actually a great issue because there's a lot of people out there who think, should I be, what should I make my kids read? And now they're super worried about having them read woke stuff or overly woke stuff. Yeah. Or, is this woke? It's like, but it's from the early nineties where people woke yet, <laughs> you know? Um, 
and the thing is you really we we have two very very in this in this area it's a very binary choice we have two choices it's cultural appropriation or cultural segregation you that can't is, you, can't, you can't, can't do anything else there's no other it. option yeah either the cultures commingle and appropriate from each other or they don't <laughs> and if they don't that's called segregation we could call that literary or mythological Which apartheid you know it's like right. it's bad i'm against it i hate it you know the melting pot of america doesn't happen if you don't read it and surround yourself with other cultures like the thing that made america what we say right. it is the melting pot exactly aspect. is that we're actually you know what we're gonna do we're gonna have the best italian food ever and it's not italian and we're gonna have yeah. Mexican food that's actually Tex Mex and Mexicali and yeah. you know and it's gonna co mingle. It's gonna all hit each other and we're gonna have Asian fusion and it's gonna be so much fun. I <laughs> feel like right. we're gonna do lots of stuff. And guess what? You can wear crotched garments. That's fine. <laughs> you can wear our pants and and you can take And we'll occasionally borrow your ponchos. It's a, it's yeah, a mutual and you can, exchange. And you can take in other cultures, you can take the Scottish Psalter and make rock and roll and gospel music. And then we can co-opt it back and then the no. British invasion can happen and like the Delta blues can meet these British schoolboys, and all sorts yeah. of amazing stuff can happen. And barbecue, you know, is, yeah. is a glorious, glorious thing. And is, you know, it's all by means of cultural appropriation. It's all by means of the co-mingling of cultures, yeah. the co-mingling of cultures gets you really really glorious stuff and i think you're it's, talking about all the specific outworkings of it but that's what the christian faith does we have a book that spans millennia and tons of cultures yeah. you know the cultures that and work. is for the whole world right and there is a common brotherhood you be baptized in and you are brothers yeah. in a way that's yeah. much deeper than blood you yeah. know the water is thicker than blood right when my kids read about polycarp or when my kids read about right. some israeli school school kid who's growing up and gonna be king someday you know the, right. <laughs> those kind of things my kids don't need to feel like uh oh i'm not allowed to be excited about david because i'm a white yeah. northwesterner right that's just a ridiculous approach and we're in a situation i am scottish irish jewish yeah you know it's like it's one of those things that we all come all of us come from brokenness and realizing that the human race is broken and the entire human race needs redemption and the entire human race will be brought back together and reunited and there will be so many pockets and flavors and differences and different approaches and styles yeah and everybody will be able to tour and enjoy yeah you know it's like it's in christ there will be yeah and we'll be able to Jew wander or, you know wander around and enjoy a great beignet and also yeah. like love a, a sloppy enchilada yep and also like the dry stuff too um right some you know love that masala. al pastor like yeah <laughs> some tikka masala know, thrown in there you know it's it's really it's just stupid it's so stupid to try to keep cultures distinct it's also impossible so is there a strong argument I mean, like what's the strongest argument for the sort of policing that these people are wanting to do I mean, I guess what, well, what, what they say, it's an anti-colonialism. It's an anti-imperialism. They don't want cultures conquering other cultures. Yeah. And it's kind of like, okay, that sounds good. You know, it's, but the way you're applying it is not that. Is that right. what the answer now, is? Yeah. The, the problem is that what we have is this weird, super weird, sentimental, nostalgic yearning for, for lost cultures when a superior thing shows up and they adopt it. So it's really weird. Crotched garments. <laughs> Crotched garments. <laughs> uh, indoor plumbing. Yeah. You know, somebody came up with that in one culture and everybody else said, that's a good idea. Let's not have open sewers. You know, we've like, had enough plagues. Yeah. And then, but then you have stuff like cell phones show up and we talk about the invasion. It's Western imperialism. And, you know, it's like this Western imperialism spreads. And it destroys cultures, cultures that were not calling each other on the phone are now calling each other on the phone. And this is the worst. <laughs> oh, no. And it's like, oh, no, we destroyed whatever. It got destroyed. But the problem is if you are that, think of yourself as that, that person in a, in a culture that was passed by other cultures technologically. And then where you're sitting and with your family, somebody comes by and says, hey, by the way, we have antibiotics now. 
and you don't have to run phone lines. You know, that whole phase of the industrial revolution where we were sending telegrams and calling each other on landlines and you never even heard of it because it didn't get to you and there weren't poles and phone lines and we didn't get a landline in every house. You can just leapfrog that. Here's a cell phone. A cell phone. And you can now talk to anyone in the world. Yeah. Like, and then, and then have some white person from Portland show up and say, no, 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 don't, don't give that to him. He can't have it. It'll destroy his culture. It's like, it's wealth. Technology is wealth and cultural advances are wealth. So it's, it's actually kind of funny because people say the British empire was built on tea and it's what happens when basically this far Eastern drink, because they started, they started adventuring and they were like, whoa, I drink this and I have more energy. (laughs) (laughs) and suddenly the british were energetic and what happens when you make the british energetic the british empire big big navies (laughs) yes (laughs) big navies lots of railroads yeah um yeah or it's going the other way you know something i'm not super thrilled about but low level anime it's just taking over the 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 school children's reading habits libraries it's what everybody's reading now is low level anime is that is that something some sort of cultural thing we should be worried about well only if you view i mean i mean sure here's why actually and we're wandering far afield but this is fun Uh, the reason why i'm excited about low level anime and by that i just mean graphic novels of a very particular animation style yeah with like low-hanging fruit for narratives is because kids not very long ago kids just stopped reading and they declared the end of reading you know it's like it was just who declared oh oh just generally like reading's over in america reading's done Mm. people don't read anymore and then measure countermeasure this this anime starts invading and kids are reading again and they're discovering the joy of reading and they're discovering the joy of reading at a lower level yeah it's Mm. lower level than they would have been reading not very long ago but it's getting them back on the reading treadmill you know they're they're back Mm. onto it and so i love that and i love seeing the popularity of these books because i don't think they're replacing novels they're not replacing novels. They're replacing video games and TV shows. And well, okay, when you put it that way, and that's fantastic. It sounds like a win. Yeah, it is, I think it is a win. And it's not to say that all of them it, are good. Or it's not whatever, to say that they're yeah. all good. And it's not to say that it's all good for every kid because there are kids who were reading big novels who are now going the other direction, Just flipping through three hundred yeah. pages of anime in an hour. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But the fact is, if they are reading and reading rapidly and picking up speed and enjoying story. Yeah, I think that's a great thing. I mean, we we talked about this already a little bit. The Amulet series are some of our yeah. favorites. We love those, and it didn't, yeah, they're didn't strange and great. Yeah, didn't hurt my kids to enjoy. Right, and Tintin's at, that way. Right, yeah. You know, Tintin's fantastic. Tintin always gave me a desire for bigger stories and more adventure, not less less and fewer. So I think the cultural appropriation can be done badly. You know, it absolutely can be done badly. Yeah. Anytime you steal something from somebody, it can, you know, obviously there's, there's risks involved in theft, Yeah, but can you steal actually from a culture? Is that culture then robbed? You know, if, if somebody travels, you know, through Ecuador and in one little village eats something, some chef is like, man, this, this combination of spices is fantastic. I cannot believe this. And they take it back to their restaurant in New York. Yeah. And then combine those spices in that way and other people fall in love with them and then it's like we've totally general changed. mills is like you know what yeah, this is yeah. amazing and they drop you know a faux version of those that spice combination on a chip and yeah you know, it just and it spreads and frito-lay is taking over and everything just goes that's how it works right i yeah, mean well we all used to agree that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery <laughs> right. you know but all of a sudden it's turned into imitation is theft right or uh uh, shoplifting abuse? shoplifting <laughs> Cultural I don't know. shoplifting some way that you take just but uh, it, imitation is about honor yeah you you imitate the myths because you really like them <laughs> right there's affection there and because i want more people to meet them right and then i want more people to say man where did this come from i'm gonna i'm gonna dig in yeah so outlaws of time was to come full circle was releasing right exactly in this moment of massive southwestern sensitivity and i was surprised i was shocked that i I kind of survived. The first book survived because the posse that I was warned was going to destroy me if I didn't pay them off uh, swarmed J.K. Rowling, 
who dropped a short story on Pottermore pulling from Navajo skinwalkers, which I actually was also drawing on in Outlaws of Time. But man, she was much bigger game. And if you attack JK Rowling with your outrage, you can get on CNN. If you attacked me, and you can get on like BBC, CNN, everywhere. JK Rowling's being accused of cultural appropriation. So I'm sitting here writing with my Navajo skinwalkers and everything else. Like I got to go to her schools and talk about my books and JK Rowling was getting assaulted at the time. They, they basically, they just chased the bigger target and, and missed me there for a minute. However, they did circle back and it did become problematic. And Harper Collins, after that first book kind of snuck out, they were, their mentality was, uh, can we just finish this very quietly? <laughs> like, <laughs> We're in contract. We don't want to ruin this relationship with you, but can we just like very, very tenderly and softly put this into the marketplace? (laughs) (laughs) Which is generally not, not how you want to launch a book series. (laughs) And then on top of this, I start struggling and I'm jumping ahead. We don't, we're going to talk about, I guess we're just talking about the whole trilogy right now, but I start jumping ahead, trying to finish my trilogy and I cannot write. I don't know. I can't figure out what is going on. Ooh, scary. Um, and I'm struggling to like get a few hundred words written in a day and stuff is just falling apart. And so, I mean, I literally is crawling over broken glass and army crawling to try to finish these books. And it was right before I hit the road for last of the lost boys outlaws of time three that I was diagnosed with a giant brain tumor and oh. everything was explained. And it's like, Oh, that's why. Uh, Oh, so I have to, I tell people, I always say when people ask, do you have a favorite book? I always say, no, I don't. They're all, they're all my children. But if I'm telling the truth, (laughs) Outlaws of Time is very, very near and dear to me because of all the suffering associated with generating that trilogy. Mm. It's the, it's the one I really suffered for. So that's a book that easily couldn't, or trilogy that could easily not have happened. Yep. It should not have happened. It was discarded by random house i got going at harbor collins just in time for this particular crusade about southwestern appropriation it comes out right at that moment barely makes it in the marketplace and then i discover a brain tumor and i have to like i just had to battle and work harder to write that trilogy than i've ever had to work to write anything Mm. and so there's a great deal of suffering in it and there's a great deal of efficiency in it that i had to find because of my own my own issues and there's it's really interesting to me because the people see outlaws of time as so distinct from my other series i don't i don't see it that way the same like the same basic building blocks of my brand are all there the way i approach a normal kid who has an a, a really abnormal you know, an abnormal world, the world that goes insane around that kid. It's the most explicitly typologically New Testament of what I'm doing anywhere, you know, where I'm starting with Sam Miracle, then I've got all the disciples around him and, you yeah, know, I've track got, their names if you have, yeah, if you have, pay attention to the names and glory is one of my favorite characters of all time, mm. as is Manuelito, as is uh, Father Tiempo. Manuelito. Father Tiempo is the one who gets you in trouble, right? Or is it Manuelito? Uh, it's actually Manuelito that gets oh, okay. me in trouble. Manuelito. Father Tiempo a little bit, but mostly Manuelito. But then by the time I was writing the last book, people were outraged that I was critical of the Aztecs. And I, I okay. have my, my kids, my heroes, go back in time to the night that everything, the wheels came off with Cortez and Montezuma and everything went crazy. Uh, and... You know, when I was critical of the human sacrifice, there was a little, a copy editor or assistant editor was writing notes in the margins saying, uh, you really shouldn't be so judgmental. This was their culture. No. Don't judge their <laughs> culture. I'm like, yeah, their culture was to rip the hearts out of people and throw their bodies down the steps. Those of were the slaves, temple. by the way, that they were yeah. ripping hearts and actually, out of. And this was an empire. And that's the thing that's so <laughs> hilarious. This is imperialism. And so like, <laughs> while I am against imperialism, in some forms, I won't even condemn it outright. But I am against imperialism in some forms. Imperialism has existed in every culture. And the Aztec Empire was an em- empire. And they were conquering neighbor- neighboring nations. And they were sacrificing their captives to their gods. You know, they're, it's they're doing bad. This, it's it was, really bad. It was bad. And it's not <laughs> to say that I think Cortez was a saint. <laughs> no. Um, I think that Cortez 
and the Aztecs deserved each other. Like, I really do. It's like these. It's like we've lost basic categories of philosophical thinking where two things can, can be wrong at the same time. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and I responded to this editor by saying, when she said, you have to realize human sacrifice was part of their culture. I responded and said, yes, and it should not have been. <laughs> Can we, can we agree? The, the perfect subjunctive <laughs> yes. works perfectly. <laughs> yeah. it, sh it should not. So my kids, my, my main characters bounce around and they jump back into the deep past and they jump into alternate variations, of, you know, variations of the world. And then they also jump um, into the future and they wander, you know, they wander back and forth, you know, in, in these adventures chasing this arch outlaw El Butre. Oh, in this big in this big battle, people find that to be inconsistent or just different. Like, oh wow, this is a this is a different uh, mythical framework. It's not. I it's a different device. You know, I'm using an hourglass. I'm using this magical hourglass and Father Time, Father Tiempo, instead of cupboards. But I do that with cupboards. Yeah, I in Dandelion Fire, I have them entering the Battle of Actium and falling out of a hatch and a sinking ship in the middle of this giant ancient sea battle. And it's an alternate version. And if they go back to Kansas and then go back through the cupboard, they go back to the same moment. If when you shut that cupboard, you know, you shut that cupboard, it resets and you go back through, you're going into the same moment in time. I've been playing with time travel mm. from my very first fantasy novel. It's just not front and center in the same way, but it is there. It is, yeah. it is present. And so, that's, that's, uh, it's all one, it's all one big thing, but I do have, this is the division. I have people, I have a lot of people who say outlaws of time is just our favorite. Like that trilogy is just our family's favorite. And then they, they want that flavor in everything. It's like, well, think of it as one like dish on the buffet of what I'm serving, you know, put it on the plate next to the other stuff. You know, I have people who just want to reread Ashtown and they don't want to read outlaws of time. It's like it's all part of one big meal I'm trying to serve with counter flavors and yeah. contrasts. And, and I don't think people can really fully enjoy all of it. Or at least I don't intend for them to fully enjoy any one piece of it yeah. without experiencing all of it. And so a lot of the time is unique in some ways, but it's more unique in setting and, you know, the mythology that I'm pulling in, but it really fits hand in glove with everything else I'm writing. And I will say, I will go on the record and say, I do kind of love it a little bit more because of how much I suffered for it. <laughs> I know that's subjective, but it was brutal. It was, it was just tough to put in the world. It's tough to keep in the world. And it's the series I have to fight about with people more than any other series who think that I'm being sinful, you know, whether against the, the laws, the Pharisees of modern virtue signaling by using myths from cultures, not my own. Mm. Well, that's awesome. I think we didn't really get into much time travel, although you're you tied that off really well at the end with connecting it all. Well done, me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well uh, done, me. I have this is the one I got a bunch of questions from okay. from uh, your middle grade readers. Can from, I real quick? I'm going to tie off time travel oh, like, yeah, even more it. than we we'll, want to do this. What I do in the time travel to make it not philosophically incoherent, because that is a question from Noah. Noah wants to know all the details. <laughs> 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 so if you think about your life as a thread and then you go back to 1981 you go back to 1981 in the future as far as your own thread goes so it was always part of your future to go back there gotcha and, and you will have always done that you know it's uh rather than going back and messing around and changing uh changing the past which then erased you know erases potentially your actual moment of time traveling back to the past. It's like, no, don't think of it that way. Think of it as a tapestry where each individual human is a thread and some of them loop back, you know, and loop back on others and they always have. It's just, it's all part of that, that weave that God made. Is that what I think happens? No, maybe, but I think it could. I think if, if time travel existed, if, uh, if that kind of thing happened, it would happen because God told the story that way, not because we individually come up with a machine that enables us to do it, but because so you're we're actually following the path that was set for us. So it's not like a machine where you suddenly jump back on a, on a video you're not, you're tape. You're not doing a control alt delete. You're not hitting a reset button and starting over. 
You're just like a thread that loops back on itself because it's, yep. yeah, gotcha. You looped back. And if you loop back again, it just, there's another loop and another loop and another loop. And there's a past, a consistent past and future the whole time. You're always moving into the future. Gotcha. You're always moving into your future. And you can't go back. And in your future, you were back in 1981 for yep. that section. Exactly. Gotcha. So anyway, that's that's how I play with it. And, and I don't want to get into the spoilers about it, but I think that answers a bunch of questions about how would it be possible for a younger self to have something happen and then an older self not to have been affected by that thing. Right. Yeah. Because it's still the future. Yeah. So it's not a... Uh, it's kind of vague, but we're going to leave it there, I guess. Yeah, we can <laughs> leave it there. We can. We're just going to move on. Yeah. And I will say this. Is there time travel in the Bible? Mm. Maybe. Well, yeah. Well, I mean, we've got time pausing. Isn't yeah. Isn't that just a step away from time travel? And uh, yeah, there's so that we have time pausing, but then we also have, you have to think about the fact that time is created. Think of time and space as part of the stage that all this is happening on that has been made. Time is not uh, the edge of reality. God exists outside of time. And we cannot even begin to comprehend what that means. <laughs> yeah. We are, we are yeah. fundamentally temporal. And so we can't, we're not going to be able to get our heads outside there. I have, I do kind of like the idea of when Moses, think, think about when, uh, when Christ, the disciples are sleeping or when Peter wakes up and wants to, wants to build tents for everybody because they look, there is the Lord, there's Christ meeting with, who? With whom is he meeting? Yeah, Moses and Elijah. Yeah, we got Moses and Elijah. Is that in Moses' story? Is that when he went up on Sinai and came back glowing? Hmm. Like, is that the same mountain? <laughs> and Interesting. I, and I actually think maybe. I actually think that's, it's, we like to think like, well, Moses descended back from heaven you know, it's like to come talk to Jesus. And I think that actually might be the moment when Moses was meeting with the Lord, hmm. when he was meeting with God and came back glowing. Mm. Those are different mountains, aren't they? Are they? No. One, are they though, one, Brian? One would have to check. Are they? <laughs> yeah. Do we really know? All I'm saying is. <laughs> yeah. You, is that, does that really actually melt your entire worldview? It should No, it doesn't. It, it really doesn't. So it shouldn't yeah. melt your worldview. It's not to say that's actually what happened. I would never make that theological, you know, that theological claim. Right. But I will say, uh, God's abilities, like, are not uh, limited by time. Right. He's looking the way, at the way we are. Your whole life, all at once, not not step by step as it goes along. Yeah. He's he's crafted and you know spoken and is speaking the entire thing. Yeah. He knows all of it. And is and is weaving every loop and every turn, you know. It's like that's it's not hard to think that he would penetrate, you know, time that way. Yeah, because he's outside of it. So anyway, he all does it with space. Is, he does it with space. Yeah, and so. all all I'm saying there is not that um, not that time travel is there, and not that that's what happened. It's just to say that if that is what happened, it do, it should not destroy your worldview. Right. Well, we are like I said with Joshua and with Moses. We have already extra hours in our time yep. period than days. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So it should really shouldn't mess with you. No, it should not. That it can move around. There we go. There That's we go. It. Moving on. All right. From Adam P. After reading book one, I was expecting seven books where Sam kills one pocket watch in each book. Right. I was disappointed the watches were all gone after book three. Why did you write it this way? <laughs> <laughs> I like this. Someone was enjoying this flavor quite a bit. Yeah, I like that. Um. I, I think it all comes down to, no joke, it comes down to how many stones David picked. Okay. Five. Five. How many did he throw? One. One. Okay. And yet, when we're told very specifically that he picked up five, and that's an important detail, and then there's, whoa, it only, <laughs> it only took one. Uh, human authors would love to pick up five and like, and he hit him in the left knee, and he hit him in the right knee, and then he hit him in the left elbow, and then he hit him in the right elbow, and, and then, then he hit him in the head. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, we want to tie off everything like that. But it would have been too easy, honestly, for me to set up each pocket watch as its own adventure. It's like, yeah, there's these different gardens, you know, there are these different gardens, and there's these different sundials, and 
watches and things, but it doesn't have to be a single volume for each one. Mm. Yeah. You know, they just, it just doesn't. It would just be a bit ponderous, I think also. Yeah. It would would be a bit much. Yeah. Quite Uh, a bit. So to correlate volumes to watches would have been a lot. And also I like the seven. I like the seven that are set up in the seven gardens and seven's a great numerological number, a number of import, but that doesn't mean I have to have separate book releases for each one and dedicate seven years of my life to it or even more. Yeah. Because I had to have a brain tumor in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Um, <clears throat> okay. You know, the other questions are from the later books in the Outlaws series. That's so. fine. Okay. We're kind of doing the whole trilogy right now. All right. That's good. Here, here we go. Anna. Some was, of my favorite titles, by the way. Run through them. Well, I like The Last of the Lost Boys. The Last yeah. of the Lost Boys is one of my favorite titles. That's a great title. Song of Glory and Ghost, also. Legend of Sam Miracle. Yep. They're good ones. They're very Western. They have that flavor. That was the goal. That was the goal. (laughs) Which was some fun stuff. Anyways, Anna was reading Lee Pike Ridge and Outlaws of Time book two in the same week and wondered. Weird. Are the caves in Lee Pike the same as the ones where Sam and Glory see Father Tiempo as a baby? No, they're not. There's the answer. They are not. But they're all caves. So the fact that you see a correlation is not. Uh, is not bad. Right. They're not physically the exact same. And as caves, they're people, typologically echoes, but that's it. Right. And Jules Verne would say they probably all connect somewhere in the middle. All right. In the last of the Lost Boys, this is a question from Nate W. Not uh, me. Al- <laughs> different Nate W. <laughs> when Alex is comparing himself to characters in Jude's books, he mentions someone named Howard. I've never come across him in all of Nate's fiction books. Who is he? Mm. What book is he from? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as if I'm not dead yet and I'm going to write something else. Hey, Howard. Well done, though. Nice, Nate. Yeah. Very good, good catch. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, a, um, there's a couple characters who are floating on my bulletin board who are holding down spots where I've always wanted to, uh, to write. And actually, Howard is a kid in a project I've always just called Street. Hmm. And it's an urban fantasy. Wow. So how close is that on the attrition list? Of well, it was high. And then it was like, man, this is the marketplace pivoted hard. So oh. the idea of writing with a black protagonist was just taken off the table by the New York marketplace. Oh. I, I still need to do it. The question is the rhythms of the industry are such that. If we'll you see. wait a little while longer, you might be able to. I had a bunch of companies trying to buy trying to buy the property from me, even in pitch form for TV shows or film. And uh, I just didn't want to go down the road yet. Kind of want to wait till the dust settles a little on the, the shakeup of the industry. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's it. There we go. Howard, good catch. Good catch on Howard. I look forward to telling Howard's It's another story Nate W. Can. Maybe you did ask your own question. You asked your, <laughs> you asked your own Good song. catch, me. <laughs> uh, there's a... Uh, there's another story that I hope to tell starring a kid named Johnny Gone that I've always just wanted to write the story of Johnny Gone. Yeah. But didn't weren't you working on a uh an adult western at some point? Or was that a, was that a movie? Oh man, I don't remember. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could call them there's a couple you could call westerns. Yeah, there's a there's a real a one that's really fun. Yeah. That uh is on is on the bulletin board as well. But there's um are there other genre, genres that you're thinking about mixing in a fun way? Well, I, in I, an unfun way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm laughing because uh, I once read a book by Jim Butcher where he mixed Pokemon and the Roman legions, which you know is an idea that does not feel like it goes together. <laughs> and so it's hard. You can't just mix any two genres and have the two things go together. And so I'm wondering, how are you, how are you approaching this? There's a lot out there. How do you choose yeah, which? If all flavors don't just necessarily combine. You um, seem to have followed the path of snakes to find the parts that would combine. So that, <laughs> <laughs> Some snicky snakes. I will say this, and here's a fun fact. Uh, back in the day, when I, weirdly, when I faked the Shroud of Turin and wrote this article called Father Brown Fakes the Shroud and ended up, and I didn't fake the Shroud of Turin, obviously. I imitated it. Time and, travel. <laughs> yeah. And discovered how one could fake it with medieval technology. Uh, in quite an easy way. 
And then that blew up and went crazy. And I, there's all sorts of opportunities to write books about the shroud and debate about the shroud and go do all sorts of shroud conferences. And, and I was trying to become a novelist and I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. And just like resisting saying no to all these shroud opportunities because I wanted to write fiction. I had a, a couple pitches out. Uh, I wrote a short story called Conversations with Todd, which I really liked. I still do. It's funny. It's my little hat tip to Flannery O'Connor uh, in a modern setting. Which Todd? I'm mixing it up. Conversations with Todd is a short story I published in the Chattahoochee Review. And then an invitation came from Esquire magazine to write short fiction. And then I started hearing from editors in New York for book proposals after that one. And after the two, and I was working on a project. Of the, so there was invitations to write adult literary which mm. is kind of funny, like to write adult literary novels. And I had a project I was working on called Thrones. And it was an all, well, it was a fantastical alternative history. Like, you know, it was fantasy, but it was a very Middle Eastern fantasy that was an apologetic for the flood. You know, it's like, this oh, wow. is, I wanted to write a, write, a, write a novel that would make the reader say, yes, kill them all, <laughs> flood the whole earth. Only save eight people. Everyone else must go. Uh, <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to write that apologetic. And HarperCollins, adult, an adult fantasy imprint, reached out and wanted that one. And then it was, man, it was, it was a wild time. And then Scholastic, Arthur Levine, reached out. They wanted Leap Ike Ridge. And I had this opportunity of like, okay, door number one or door number two or door number three. Mm -hmm. Do I want to go with adult literary? But I had no career yet at all so i was i had written two short stories really and uh had faked the shroud of turin do i want to publish adult literary fiction do i want to publish adult fantasy thrones and or do i want to write children's fiction mm -hmm. and all three doors opened and all three doors opened at the same time and it was very very it was an odd moment because it was like which which one do i want to do and they're all such different routes and I, I obviously picked kids because I wanted to write with concrete endings. I wanted to write with classic structures, classic story structures. I didn't want to have to be constantly subverting and revolutionary and, you know, all, all the things that were the case in, in literary fiction and adult literary fiction at the time. Uh, I wanted to have concrete resolution. And I also didn't want to write, I didn't want to have to like infuse content i didn't i wanted to write pg-13 i didn't want to write hard r fiction which at the time trying to write mainstream adult fantasy meant you had to kind of go a little hard r yeah or they would be really disappointed like this is for kids right this is for teens this is where's where's the the really nasty stuff and so i picked children's of those three doors i've never regretted that and i've been super grateful to pursue the you know, the trajectory of that. And then afterwards, Game of Thrones started dropping. I was like, well, I can never write an adult fantasy called Thrones mm. at this point. And there's the perfect picture of what I, I didn't want to do. Yeah, totally. You like to stand out by writing shocking and obscene and gratuitous stuff. Yeah, be it and to die a, man, a, a very old man alone and unable to finish his yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> right. So anyway, it was a weird moment. It's a weird fun fact that all three doors opened simultaneously. And God's done that a couple of times in my life where it's like, well, pick. <laughs> yeah. You can't do all of it. This will not happen in sequence. You can go on this road or that road or the other road, which is something I do with my own characters often. I was just thinking of the Silent Bells. Yep. Like pick. Like you're just going to pick and you're going to go. And that's, and that's it. And so there are novels I've never written that maybe I will, that I, that I want to write in different markets. And maybe I never will because I chose these novels. Yeah. And there's only so many years in somebody's life. Which, side note, seems like a good definition of what, it, what, what you want to raise boys, um, you know, boys to be. We talked girls, a girls episode. We should have a boys <laughs> episode at some point. Now that I, I, we just found out we're having our fifth boy. So uh, gotta, we got to talk about that. Boys have to be able to choose. We're going to do some Brian Cole therapy yeah. about raising sons <laughs> in a future episode. And All actually, right. raising sons is, a, is a, a great topic to cover, especially connected to fiction and story. Yeah. So awesome. there you go. All righty. We kind of covered, I think, that whole trilogy. 
read the Outlaws of Time, witness the suffering that was involved, appreciate the hardship <laughs> I went through to write that trilogy. Yeah. And understand time travel is not a philosophical contradiction. <laughs> Necessarily, just probably is. <laughs> Peace. Brand. If you enjoyed this episode, get your signed copy of Outlaws of Time, The Legend of Sam Miracle at canonpress.com.